This is FBG Jen and FBG Kristen. And I'm FBG Margo, host and producer. You're listening to the podcast that will help you keep a lid on the junk in the trunk and inspire you to live a happy and confident life. Each episode, we chat with motivational experts and celebs and share our own candid adventures in being healthy. If you're looking for a podcast that's equal parts hilarious and enlightening, well then welcome to the Fit Bottom Girls podcast. Inspire yourself, inspire others, and smell great naturally with Inspire Bath deodorant sprays and lotions. We use them, we love them, and we think you will too. So just go to inspirebath.com. Welcome back to the Fit Bottom Girls podcast. This is FBG Margo, and on the line today, we have FBG Jen. Hello. And we have FBG Kristen. Hey, hey. Hey, you guys. This is part two of our our interview with Patricia Moreno. And yes, we had such a great time talking to her, and she was filled with so much knowledge and, and incredible wisdom. We had to put this into a two-part show. So you guys were telling me, like, you feel like this reminds you both of the interview we did last year with Daniel Laporte. Yeah, for me, it really, really did, because she drilled down into actually something that we talk about in Fit Bottom Girls all the time, which is what's your why? Like what is not just looking a certain way, but like why do you want to look a certain way? Why do you want to feel a certain way? Like what is your why? And then really focusing in and drilling down on that feeling um, and then how you can get that feeling in your everyday life. And that is like, I mean, that's kind of what Daniel Laporte's Firestarter Sessions, um, that book was all about. And that kind of blew my mind when I read that. And I, she talked about that a little bit in the interview with um, Daniel Laporte. But I thought there was a lot of good, you know, crossover with that and with us and just, you know, and if you haven't pondered that question before, please ponder that question. <laughs> we can help you do that. We're like super into finding your why, aren't we, Kristen? Very much so. So I also really responded when she was talking about like dealing with the fitness industry. There's all this pressure to look a certain way. And I believe we also went over this with Dave Smith too, our fit bottom dude that we have on the show from time to time. And I remember something he said on the air. He said something about how, you know, we need to learn how to normalize fitness more. And as fitness bloggers, as instructors, as people in the fitness industry, like people sometimes look at us and think we need, we should appear a particular way. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel. Do you ever feel pressured to look a certain way and how do you handle it? One of my biggest, I mean, fitness industry being, being and working in it, like pet peeves is, I don't know exactly where it comes from, but I, there is that pressure that you that I think a lot of people feel like they do have to look a certain way, like that perfect image of fitness. And if they don't, then they can't give advice. That's what my like past in history was. But I, I still see it all the time where I see, you know, on fitness and we've had people on our show who have very candidly talk about this um, where, you know, they have the, they have the abs and they have the, the, the ridiculous thigh gap or whatever the, the trend is, the ridiculous trend is at the time. And they're, you know, doing fitness competitions or like bikini competitions or something. And they're highly restricted and they are, you know, working out a ridiculous amount. And that's what they're showing in all their photos. But then what they're, you know, selling or what they're marketing is, well, you don't have to diet. You don't have to exercise. Come do my, you know, program. And I think the, the subconscious is like, you'll look like me and you won't have to do anything. And I think that there's a disconnect and a dis, you know, um, a little disingenuous, really, to be like, here's what I'm selling, but that's not like that's not health. And I think it's a big problem in the industry. I, and I, that's why I think this interview with Patricia is so fascinating because she just so candidly talks about that. Like, do you feel that pressure, Margot? Like you teach classes? I have to say to you guys. So uh, a good friend of mine, a few months ago, we were talking, and she was telling me about how much she loves a Zumba class. And how great the instructor is. But she goes, but you know, I have to tell you, he's got a little bit of a belly. So sometimes it bothers me. And I was taken aback by it. And then I met the guy and he's, he has a fine body. It's totally fine. And I was just like, oh my God, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) that big fear you have in the back of your hair head of, am I really being scrutinized like all over right now by every person in the room? And I think kind of for some people, yeah. And unfortunately, it's one of those truths you have to get used to. If you're going to put yourself out there, you know, you, you are putting yourself literally on stage for, Mm -hmm. for judgment or criticism or unwanted, you know, comments. Um, And that is a, 
a scary thing, a scary thing to do. And like fat stigma is, is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. That's really, really, it's really, really unfair and not just, and you know, health does literally come in all, you know, shapes and sizes and weights and that's been proven, but that's not always how everyone acts. So, well, and I think that by when you have people of different shapes and sizes teaching and being seen as leaders in the field, you know, yes, you are going to have some people who, who have comments or who have a reaction to that. But I think it's also a great opportunity to get people to really like, look at why it is they're doing this class or why it is that they want to do this particular workout. You know, is it, are they only there because they want to have perfect abs? Because let me tell you, you won't get your perfect abs in the class. You will get your perfect abs like in a thousand ways. It's not going to come from this 30 minutes twice a week. And also like why, you know, as we were just saying, like, if that's really where your brain goes, then think a little bit about why it is that that's your big driving goal. Why, you know, is there something else to it? Is there, you know, is there a feeling that you think you're going to get because you'll have those, those perfect abs? Um, so yeah, I think that it's, I think it's great to have people like, you know, like all kinds of people out there doing, you know, teaching fitness, doing their thing, sharing their expertise, because yes, health looks, feels, and is different for everybody. Well, and what I love, just to take it back to Patricia, is I love how she talks about this and I love how, you know, now, you know, she clearly is in, you know, the body that works well for her now, you know, kind of outside of a lot of those pressures, probably not all of those pressures, but outside of the majority of those pressures. And now she just kind of gets to be. And I, I mean, the way for it all to pretty much change is for, you know, really a lot of people to just, who are working in the industry, just like, not give a shit. You know what I mean? To just mm-hmm. be like, no, like I am going to teach my class. And that probably needs to start more at a, and now I'm trying to like solve the world, but that probably also needs to start from a management level um, and in clubs and all that sort of stuff, kind of the the health at every size move, movement. But there's, there's a lot of work to be done, yeah. but I'm glad that Patricia is speaking her piece because it's needed. Absolutely. So yes, you guys, I hope you really enjoy this episode. Like I said, it's our two parter. We both love talking to her and you can find us on social media at Fit Bottom Girls. If you want to send us an email, it's podcast at fitbottomgirls.com. And if you like the show and you're an Apple podcast, if you could please leave a five star review, we'll read all of the five star reviews on the air. That would be amazing. And so here we go with part two with Patricia Moreno. Remember, this show is sponsored by our fave all-natural deodorant line, Inspire Bath. In fact, for every bottle you purchase, they donate one to help build and empower women and girls at shelters and interim homes. Get yours and help give back at inspirebath.com. Our guest, Patricia Moreno, has been training, mentoring, and educating people all over the world for over 30 years. In an effort to end her own struggle with her weight, eating disorders, and body image issues, she created the Intensati 2 Method, a life-transforming workout which combines her expertise in fitness, dance, martial arts, yoga, nutrition, meditation, and spiritual practices. Encouraged by her own transformation and the life-changing stories of her students, Patricia has gone on to create several other workouts, courses, and workshops, including Yoga Sadi, Warrior Sadi, Core Sadi, Dance Sadi, and the Intel Sadi Leadership Training. She is committed to being a powerful force for positive change in the world and continues to find revolutionary ways to uplift her students and help them to change inside and out. Patricia believes that through conscious, intentional living, a commitment to excellence, and the power of love, every person is able to live a life filled with peace, happiness, and joy. we have a lot of fitness instructors and a lot of trainers, especially that listen to our podcast. And I wanted to ask you, like, how do you think fitness professionals can do a better job of helping people versus hurting them or or setting them up to some impossible standard? You know, how can we normalize fitness more? Mm, That's such a good question. And it's really such an area that 
I'm passionate about because I think that a lot of us that get into the fitness industry come from the very place that I came from, right? Like we really want to do it. We, we have our own issues with our body and we kind of want to be that beacon for other people. So we go these extra miles and it's really with a good heart, right? I, it, it's not easy to be in the fitness industry. You work very, very, very hard. And uh, I think that what happens is we all get caught up in this ideal mentality. And I think right now we're at a really good time that we can start shifting the conversations because people are more open to it. So I would say number one thing is absolute transparency, transparency, like tell your people the truth of what it takes for you to have that body right? If you're teaching five classes a day and eating 1200 calories, tell the truth, first of all, and tell the truth of how much, what does it really, 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 really take to achieve that? And if we could be more open and honest and transparent and authentic about who we are as leaders in this industry and really talk about honestly where we feel stuck or where we feel trapped because often we feel trapped that we've got to look this certain way or our classes won't be packed. Or if I have a little bit of cellulite, what, how embarrassing or such a shame, or in order to be better than the, so much competition, I have to have this body that's like outrageous and outstanding, but we have to start really reflecting on one. Are we deceiving people and in, in saying, oh, just take my class 45 minutes a day. It'll look like me. Or are we telling the truth? And also watch the conversation in the room and get out of the fat talk. I would just say, please do your best to get out of the fat talk. What's fat talk? Fat talk is, oh my gosh, you lost weight. You look great. Oh my gosh, I can see your muscles. You look so much leaner. You look fantastic. Congratulations. Because all of that just reinforces this idea that we get praise and we feel worthy when our body looks this certain way. And instead, have the conversations in the fitness rooms, not about weight, not about body, but about capability, about skill, about overcoming something that, and how that translates into everyday life and not about bikini body ready or get ready for the summer or work off the Thanksgiving dinner that you had or the sweat is your fat crying or get your fat butt. Like, stop talking about body parts and talk about the ability to use your spirit to overcome challenges and relate it more to real everyday life. And that exercise is not just about reaching a goal. It's medicine. It's something we do every day to awaken our spirit, to bring energy and vitality into our body so that we can be better parents, so that we can be better creators, so we can be better business owners and really start to link the value of the body towards something much more than just how we look. That to me, I think would be a game changer. And I think it's not happening uh, as fast as uh, I thought it would be by now, actually. Yeah, I agree. Anytime I'm in a class and someone you know, is like, oh, that's okay. You know, you ran. So now you can go eat, you know, chips and salsa or eat tacos tonight. I'm always right. just like, oh, face palm. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, all, all in due time, right? All um, in due time. So I'm curious, and this, this kind of conversation um, helps. So if you're having, you know, a conversation with someone or you've got a friend who is maybe not in a great, like, body image type place and is being obsessive, you know, and is, is really kind of in the, in the trap, if you will, and kind of the dieting trap. I feel like, you know, it's it's very easy for, you know, those of us who've kind of been on the other side of it to be like, down with diets, you know, like this mm -hmm, is, you know, mm -hmm. you're you're really beating your head against your wall here, but you kind of need a little bit of a, you know, a softer approach because it's difficult. Making that transition is, is really, oh really hard. And going through these emotional spiritual lessons is so hard. So what tips can you give for maybe having, I know you said no, you know, kind of stop with that fat talk, but any other tips you could help for helping other people through this? Yeah, I think that's such a good question. And I love that you just made that point because I'll tell you, uh, you know, I just stopped teaching regularly. I teach now once a month, I do events, I do retreats and things like this, but I really thought I was further along than I was. And then when I stopped teaching, 
it was like, what the heck just happened? Part, I was, I had an injury. I had adrenal fatigue. Um, I just literally could do nothing. So I went from doing five hours, teaching five to six hours, plus my own workout a week, which to me was light, right? That was my light schedule to doing nothing. And so I gained weight, my muscle tone left. Like I was in like post-traumatic stress disorder and I'm, it was no joke. I'm like, whoa, literally, this is really scary. The things that I was saying, the fear that I had around this being in this body that I had been like forcing and fixing and pushing and molding for so many years. And now I don't have it really took me for a deep, dark spin. And I just thought, wow, this is really evidence of how deep this conversation goes. And I was like, okay, I'm no more dieting. I can't do that anymore. But what do I do? But what do I do? Like, I'm not, I, I can't just like go and do like this, you know, everybody's selling intuitive eating and, you know, just be tuned in. But when you've been tuned out for so long and you've been using things like diet pills or energy drinks or all of these things to like annihilate cravings and hunger. You don't even know what your natural settings are. There's just nothing normal about you. So to make that shift is very, very, very scary and very, very challenging. So I think something that's really important to to do when you're helping people through these, or if you're helping yourself through it, is to kind of move very slowly and to just start thinking, okay, let's start looking at why we have these feelings of fear or why we are so hard on ourselves at certain weights, or maybe you're in a very big body and that to you is either not normal or you feel like You can't get to a number without extreme dieting that you'd really like to. And it's to start using it as an opportunity to wake up and to start questioning where did this fear come from? And where did all, where did I learn this message? Who is profiting from me hating my body? Who is profiting from me feeling like I need to lose a few more pounds? I'm not saying you don't have to lose the pounds. And I'm not saying that's not even something that we could look at if we really want to. But to first start looking at the fear that you've accumulated that's been handed down to you, the messaging, the expectations, and just start there for a second. So at least you can start to question, is this really mine? Is this really mine? And is this really something that if I want to go to this place requires a lot of my attention and and strictness or restriction, then I'm going to contemplate that very slowly and kindly and mindfully. And then just start looking at your habits that you have now and say, what are the habits that would not be a diet, but that I could upgrade and be consistent with that would be structured, that would be good, that would be in alignment with my values, that would have integrity. You know, for me, exercise is medicine. It literally is. And I do it daily and I don't weigh myself, but I do it daily because I need it. And so starting to change why you want to do those habits, but putting different values with it. If, if sugar is your thing and you're someone who just goes down the rabbit hole when you have sugar or processed foods, not seeing it as a diet, but say maybe that one thing It needs to be something that I detox from for a while so I can get my body back to its natural settings where I know I can start to trust my intuition. First, I have to look at how am I harming myself and can I just stop harming myself for a little while and slowly see what happens. But I really feel like it's really an area that we all need to just start self-reflecting on why we're making the choices we're making. Are those our choices? Are those choices that we've bought into? And do they really work for us or not in a long-term kind of way? And then make very small little steps so that the whatever steps we do choose to make, they're sustainable. They're working into our lives. They feel good. And they're not harming us. So speaking of things that we do every day, I wonder if you have... Um, if you have any interesting insight or if there's anything you'd like to share about how you begin each day, because I, I I know that we've seen from a lot of, a lot of really 
of people who really have it figured out, they seem to have a morning routine or at least a few things that they go through each day to kind of set themselves up to be their best. Mm. And I, I feel like that might be you. <laughs> it is. And I actually became very diligent about this um, probably about four years ago because I was, you know, I've studied meditation and mindfulness and yoga and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a great seeker, a student, and I love to learn. But then the, the bridge between information and integration can be quite large sometimes. So I started just by picking one or two things that I could commit to for a while so that I could see if those things were actually really going to be working for me. And that's what I really suggest. It's like, find those things that work for you and then commit for an amount of time. And morning is by far the best time to do it because nothing can actually get in your way except for the snooze button. But the things that I like to do are, I always do a breath work because it's the thing that if I do this one particular breath work, I feel grounded, it opens my heart, and I feel like I can be super present throughout the day. And then I always visualize what is the best case scenario of whatever it is I'm working on. So right now I'm working on a new program and we're launching it in January and it's actually revolves around a morning practice. And to really under, to reinforce this idea that it all starts in your thinking, in your visualizing, in your, the way that you manage your mind, your focus and your concentration. And that this skill is the one that gives kind of the best return on your investment. So what I do is I do something that gets me into my heart, could be a song, could be a breath work. Um, I write down whatever it is my goals are. And then I actually just sit for a moment and really visualize that it's already done and do whatever I can to bring up this feeling of gratitude. Uh, one of the exercises that I did, which is like a great exercise anybody can do. Gratitude is it, right? Gratitude is like the magic potion emotion. If you can rile that up in the morning, you're really off to a good start. But one of the things that I did for like a year in a row was I wrote a thank you letter. I did it towards my wife, right? So every morning I wrote her a thank you letter. It could have been, thank you for changing the light bulbs last night. You know, I really appreciated that you did that. And if it was me, it would have stayed broken for another month, right? Just so looking for things that can really awaken this powerful, powerful feeling. It becomes a brand new lens of yourself and your day. And when you have this new state awakened within you, you have access to things you didn't have access before. So creating whatever ritual you like for yourself, but the key is consistency. Consistency is power because then it infuses you with this power that you can then direct towards actions that are aligned with that very thing that you deem is important. Can you talk a bit about real self-love in action and what yeah. that looks like to you? Uh that's a good question. Self-love is something I think there's a lot of us trying to figure out these days. And I think where a lot of us get into a problem is we think of love as this kind of just romantic emotion. And we have it really confused because we think, how do I, how do I love myself in this body? Like I have pounds to lose or these wrinkles or this cellulite or how do I love my life when I am not where I want to be? Or how do I love my partner when they're being a total jerk, right? So we think that love is conditional and that love is something that is the result of what people do or what we have, or how we look. So first we have to really recognize that love is an action and it actually is something that is in its real sense, not conditional. And I think that gratitude is the closest emotion to love and easier for us to awaken um, because we are so far from the idea of what real love is. So I think if we really move into appreciation and gratitude, 
so many of us walk around, oh, I didn't do that and that wasn't enough and it's still not there and always looking at just where we are not yet or what we don't like that we've trained ourselves to reinforce this negativity bias. We all have a negativity bias. We have like 60,000 thoughts a day. 99.9% .9 of those are negative and they're the same thoughts that we had yesterday and the day before. So if you can really get a practice of gratitude, gosh, I took one step today. Wow. I, I'm so grateful. I was able to at least do that wow, my body is working. My heart is pumping. It can sound kind of like woo woo or silly, but it actually is something that we have to do to create these new habits of really seeing ourselves in a new view. And it requires step by step, day by day, consistent action. And your ego is going to go, oh, give me a break. That's not going to work. Or yeah, right. Why don't you lose five pounds first? Or come on, this is ridiculous. You better get your butt out there and do more, you lazy X, Y, Z, you know? So when we hear that other voice fighting back and we're that cynical, pessimistic, um, guilt inducing inner critic, if you can think of that as just a program and you got to rewrite the program, you got to pay the price and do the investment to rewrite the program. It doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen just by desire alone. You have to actually sow those seeds and interrupt that constant negative news that you're always feeding yourself. And simple, it doesn't have to be that hard, but it must be a consistent practice. So you have two daughters? Is that right? Three. Twins Three. that are six and a and an eight-year-old. Okay, wow. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you're raising them to maybe not have as much of this to rework? <laughs> oh my gosh. You so know what's been your process, yeah. I'll tell you, this is I was, I remember reading something from Brene Brown, right? And she was reading a question someone had asked her that said, you know, I understand about all of this stuff, but how are we going to raise our kids? How are we going to raise our kids without all of this messaging? And she said, you know, that's like trying to, it's like telling your kids to inhale and never exhale. And it's never going to happen. What we have to do is we have to build resiliency. We have to, we have to actually uh, work into work with the system that we have and teach kids about resiliency. And so what I really try to remember for myself is that I'm not going to be able to save them from all the messaging. I'm not going to be perfect in my own expressions of this and in my own patterns or habits, even though I've worked a lot and really feel like I've come a long way. Um, the best thing to do is to keep reinforcing this idea that our body is so amazing, right? It can change and it grows and there's, there's different shapes and sizes. And the more we take care of it, the better we feel in it. And that's really where I am right now. Like, you know, the kid, my kids are, are young and I'm feeding them most of the time. So I have a lot of control in this time right now. And, and I'm actually trying to give them the reins more and more to just say, you know what, how does that feel when you eat that? Mommy, do I have to eat the whole thing? Well, you have to listen to your tummy and I'm not your tummy. You have to decide for yourself when you're full and when you're not, and if that feels good and if it doesn't. So just teaching a lot about being able for them to make their own decisions based on how they feel and, you know, just keep talking about more than how they look, what they wear, their pretty face or their pretty hair and talk more about their skill level and what's possible and how hard they've worked on a certain project and really keep reinforcing that they are more than a body, that they are more than beautiful, that they are more capable than what even the world might ask of them. And, you know, it's a step-by-step -step process for all of us, including myself. So what's coming up next for you? What do we need to know? What do you need to know? Um, yeah. I really am, one, I'm, I'm working a lot on programs that are going into schools, which I'm super excited about. Um, but what I really believe is, I really believe that the most underutilized skill that we have is this power to direct 
and control our thinking and to have awareness that these thoughts that we have in our mind are just programs and that they're we're not our thoughts. We are actually the thinker of the thoughts. And I really believe that this, if we can train ourselves and practice to develop this level of self-awareness and self-direction, that we can actually create the life that is more in alignment with our values and our purposes and our passions. So the program that I've created is called Sati 365, and it is 365 days of practice of directing your thoughts and, um, really actually developing your mind, your imagination, your inner self-talk to really be the map for the future that you want to sow the seeds for. And so that's Salty365. We're actually starting in January, one group of people for 365 days. And I'm super excited about that. So please tell everybody where they can find you on the web and on social media. Awesome. Social media, Patricia Moreno 33. My website is patriciamoreno.com. And if you want to find out about what we're starting in January, it's patriciamoreno.com forward slash 365. And then we just have one more question, if that's okay. Sure. So we ask this of everybody that comes on to the show. What was the last song you listened to before you did this podcast interview? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I l pulled out an old mantra meditation, um, and it was a mantra meditation called Har. Har is a prosperity ma meditation, and I did that this morning before the interview. Oh, well, I not love that. that. <laughs> it's very appropriate. Is it? Good. Yeah, I think so. Like, it feels very, like, in line with everything we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. <laughs> A little, little off the pop top 40 path. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. But we love That's those okay. answers. We do. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you so much for being on the show today. You're a fantastic guest. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I so appreciate it. I love what you guys are doing. You're such a blessing. And you're so like helping move all this powerful and positive conversation forward. And I just want to give you a big applaud and a big virtual hug. And really, I love what you guys do. Thank you so much. Love this show? Tell us why in a five-star review on iTunes, and we'll read it on the air. Also, make sure you are a subscriber. If you want to reach out to say hi or have a question about a recent episode, yay, well, feel free to email us at podcast at fitbottomgirls.com. And if this podcast jives perfectly with your brand, consider sponsoring the show. Get more info by emailing advertising at fitbottomgirls.com. Find all kinds of Fit Bottom goodness online and on social media at Fit Bottom Girls, Fit Bottom Mamas, Fit Bottom Eats, and Fit Bottom Zen. And if books and movies are your thing, check out the other podcast I co-host called Book vs. Movie, which you can find anywhere where you search for podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.